Well, welcome to Stonebridge. We're so glad you're here. Would you stand and sing with us? My name is Eric, and I'm so glad you joined us here this morning, and I hope that even this morning you can see the great things that God is doing in this place and in your life. But even if you're not, I hope you can let the words of this next song just wash over you and believe that we worship a God who fights for us and who will part the seas to make a way for us. Would you sing? So 
Thanks, everybody. You can be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Wayne, and I am really excited that you are here. It's great to be worshiping with you today in this auditorium. And for those of you that are online, glad you're there. Glad you're worshiping. Glad you've chosen to join us today. Thank you very much for that. We hope that you find hope and encouragement in our time together today. If you're brand new here with us, special welcome. We'd love for you to do a couple things. Go to the sb.church website, give us just a brief little bit of information, and then stop by at our welcome home room just out behind here, and uh, we've got a free gift for you. In fact, if you're online, you can do the same thing. Just drop us a little note in the chat, and we've got a gift for you as well. Hanging on the garage wall of my house are several extension cords and a couple of hoses. They're really pretty nice, but they don't do one thing if they're not plugged in or connected. You see, around here, we talk a lot about getting connected and getting plugged in. Yeah, I know you can come and you can attend and, and you leave and go away, but there's really something special when you get plugged in and connected. So maybe you're thinking, well, how do I do that? What are the next steps? Well, one of those next steps is next Sunday. It's called First Steps. Maybe you would like to find out more about Stonebridge. What do we do? How do we do it? Why do we do it? What makes us tick? We would invite you to check out sb.church for more details. Please know it's next Sunday. There is lunch and babysitting couple of really good things. So make a note of that. We'd love to have you attend that as well. We have a lot of activities coming up over the next little while. This time of the year, there are pumpkin patches to go to. There's tailgates to go to. There's a variety of different things. And some of them are with our young people, with the youth, but many of them will involve you as well. And they're just times and places for you to get connected, to get plugged in, to get acquainted. We'd love for you to get connected with Jesus, but we would love to connect with you as well. We can't fuel any of those things without your contributions. So we do thank you ahead of time. Many of you have given online, and we're grateful for that. Thank you for doing that. You may also check out our sb.church website. You can arrange things that way. We've got boxes by the doors, and if you would like to give that way, you can do that. In fact, if you're online, and if you want to help us out, we would be grateful. So thank you for your gifts. We appreciate that very much. Well, we are in the middle of a sermon series entitled Route 66. And what we're doing is exploring the top 10 destinations through the 66 books of the Bible. That's where we get the name Route 66. Pastor Mark is on his way up here in just a second. We're going to hear about the king is here. Good to see you all. Look what I just found. I have a cup holder now. Thank you. I've been gone for one week and I get a cup holder. I should have gone a lot earlier. Last weekend I was at the Fremont campus and the Millard campus and I got to listen to Jed Mullinex preach. He's a great preacher, you right? You know, it's like super good. And we're super excited to be able to bring him on to our staff as a teaching pastor, which means he'll preach about six times a year for our church, and we're really excited to be able to have him be a part of it. Incredible communicator, great guy, and uh, is becoming a good friend, so we're uh, thrilled to be able to have him around. The, during the week, Linda and I were actually on Route 66 for a little while. We were going to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, which is one of our favorite places and great destination, and we, I, I found like, oh, we're going to go right through, and, we're, and so we did. We went to a, a diner, and uh, a malt shop, and it was super fun when we were in St. Louis. I, we punched in the numbers to the uh, 
malt shop, and, and when we turned, it says, you are now on Route 66. Like, that's so cool. And so we stopped and got a pretty expensive malt, and, and uh, it was great. It was super fun. But uh, Route 66, I hope you've been enjoying it. We're now turning the corner, right? This is a big moment where we're now entering into the New Covenant, the New Testament. And we spent you know, several weeks now, going, five weeks going through the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament, and it really starts with Christmas. Now, Jed talked about the last weekend is where the nation of Israel wanted a king. And he, he's like, we, you don't need one. It's like, yeah, but we want one. Yeah, but you don't need one. Yeah, but we want one. You ever have that discussion with your kids? I want this, but you don't need it. Yeah, but I want, or maybe your husband, or, you know, I, I want the motorcycle. You don't need one. I want, yeah, okay. Right. And so eventually what God does is says, okay, which should scare the heebie-jeebies out of all of us. Because God will eventually say to us, if you want it, you can have it. And you're like, what? Yeah, you can have it. it I'm, I've, I've warned you, and I've warned you, and I've warned you. But I'm not going to force you. So if you want to have that, you can have that. But I've warned you, and I told you, there's lots of consequences with all those things. And what we notice is that a consequence of having a king is what? Well, kings love power and they love money. We have kings today, not in the United States. We said, no, we don't want a king. And uh, now we just have politicians, right? Who seemingly like power and money too. Now, a king, though, is not elected. They, they, uh, you, they have to die and uh, get them out of office. And so that's why there's a lot of brutality and a lot of violence because somebody wants to overthrow the king. But kings like money. Uh, the kings in, the, in our world today like money. The king of Thailand uh, is worth 30 to $43 billion. The king of Thailand. Little Thailand. Now, uh, that's a big range between 30 and 43, but that's still a pretty impressive amount of money. The Sultan of Brunei is worth 20 to 28 billion. The King of Saudi Arabia, 18 billion. Kings are doing really well right now. They're doing fine. Now, how do kings get their money? They take it from the people. They tax them. Now, if you happen to be in Saudi Arabia, you're going to get the oil money too. So this is really great, right? It's going so well. Now, Israel had uh, King Saul, then King David, then King Solomon. Now, in three short king things, King Solomon becomes the richest person on the planet. That's how quickly he has amassed his fortune, that he gets all this money. And who wouldn't want to be king? Well, it turns out lots of people want to be king. And the nation of Israel eventually splits and becomes just a shadow of what it was one, at one time. Kings lorded over their subjects, and you have to pay. That's why Israel hated the Romans, right? Because they had a Caesar who said, uh, I need your money. And they're like, no, we don't want to give you money. It's like, but, and they had to. They, could, they couldn't do it. They had no power. And absolute power, as we know, corrupts absolutely. That's why even saying things, well, I'm the king of my castle, is kind of a dangerous statement to say. Basically, says, I want to control everything. I'm going to be in charge of everything. Anybody a king of their castle? Uh, controlling. Here, here's, what, here's how you know who the king is. The remote control tells everything. <laughs> who controls the remote control? Eventually, what happens to happen, what has to happen in that kingdom is you need two TVs. Now, in my, in my little uh, kingdom, we have one TV, just one. And so it's uh, survival of the fittest, whoever gets there first kind of stuff. And, um, and so that's, that's how it works. But kings like money and power, and that's why violence and force are used all the time. And Israel got what they wanted. They got a king. And eventually the kingdom would be destroyed. But there was a promise that the kingdom would last forever. In 2 Samuel, the prophet says, Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time. Your throne will be secure forever. And, and the people are like, that's what we want. And the king was like, that's what I want. And, and that's what they were hoping for. But it didn't seem to happen. 
Even the prophet Daniel said, As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming from the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will not be destroyed. And everybody goes, when's that going to happen? When can we get that ruled out? That would be great. We'd like a kingdom like that where everybody everyone is included everyone is a part of it and everyone is going to be together but it didn't happen and hundreds and hundreds of years go by and the dream and the thought that a, that kingdom is just faded i mean it was a little talk about it ever so often but really people had kind of given up and they were hopeful Ever so often there'd be some people, some, some person who'd come on the scene and think, he's the guy, he's the guy, he's the guy. Then finally, a baby is born. Christmas happens. And everybody you would have thought would be excited. Not too many people were excited about it. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, where's the newborn king? Where's the new king? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. And that had to be a little, well, disconcerting if you're the king and you don't know anything about a baby being born. And Herod did not want to give up his throne. And so he asked these wise men, hey, when you find him, you, you tell us so we can go worship him as well. And uh, in verse 3, it says, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Everybody's talking about it. All the word got out, and the, you know, the rumor mill's happening, and everybody's scared, and everybody's nervous. And am I going to lose my job? And is my head going to be? And all that kind of stuff. And Jerusalem is in an uproar. In a little town six miles away in Bethlehem, there's a little baby. The wise men find him, and they worship. And they leave without telling Herod. And Herod is now incredibly mad and nervous and paranoid. See, when you have power and money, you don't want to lose that grip, right? You don't want to lose control. No, 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 no. And, and, and he takes matters into his own hands. And this king kills all the little babies within a six-mile radius of Bethlehem, all the little baby boys, two years and under. Think about that. The king of Israel kills all the little babies. That had to be a horrific moment, a, a time where uh, all these families are, are, are devastated. I can't even imagine the, what the streets of Bethlehem were like. But when you don't want to lose power and you don't want to lose your money, you'll do whatever. 31 years later, a political leader wants to know if Jesus is king. In John chapter 18, verse 34, it says, Jesus replied, is this your own question or did others tell you about me? So the question was, are you the king of the Jews? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted, your own people and their leading priests brought you before me to, for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. Some wanted to, right? We know that Peter took out a sword. They were willing to fight for him. And Jesus had to put, no, that's not what this kingdom's about. My kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus is ushering in a new kingdom. And there's never been a king like him. No king has ever ruled over his kingdom like jesus it wasn't about power it was about serving in matthew 20, 20 uh, 21 it says the mother of james and john the sons of zebedee came to jesus with her sons she knelt respectfully to ask a favor what's your request she replied well in your kingdom please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you one on your right and on the other the left now, that's an impressive mom. 
you know, you think right now it's like how moms control everything. It's like, hey, you, you're going to talk, talk the teachers into giving your kid a better grade and get you on the ball team and, you know, hover around you for a while. This, mom, this mom's impressive. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, I want one of my boys on your right and I want one of my boys on your left. That takes, think about, that took a lot of <laughs> courage to get that. I mean, she's going before Jesus and says, hey, I know you're going to set up a kingdom and someday it's going to be awesome. So I want my boys in power. I want them in power. In Matthew 20, 24, it says, when the 10 other disciples heard that James and John had asked, they were indignant. <laughs> we should ask. We're, Mom, Mom, why didn't you ask? But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people. You know what a king is like? You know what kings do? They lord it over the people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, we're all going to be servants in this kingdom. Nobody's going to lord it over anybody. We're all going to serve one another. S servants have no power, no authority, really, really probably any money. No, certainly not, not any, you know, they, they can't power up on anybody. Servants can't do that. We're going to serve. That's what the king, this is what this kingdom is going to be like. No king has ever set up his kingdom like that, where everybody's going to serve one another. The apostle Paul would help Help us to uh, know what that's like. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. And what does that sound like? Oh, yeah, high school. Oh, yeah, freshman year of college. Oh, yeah, promotion time. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. What? Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Thinking of others better. Now, you're probably looking around and going, hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, not in this room. I mean, there might be some people in this room that might be a little bit better than me, but I don't, I don't really, I mean, if, like, if Scott Frost came in, now, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But if he came in, it would be like, Mr. Frost, come sit here in the front row. We're all right here. You, uh, you. You can come sit at my table at, at the Porky Butts after church. Uh, you know, Mr. Fr I, by the way, I got a few things you might want to take a look at. <laughs> you know, my, my kid's a kicker. <laughs> you know, there's, all, there's a lot of other people that are, that are, we would go, yes, they're more important, more impressive. You know, the, the governor comes in or one of our senators. Yes, you're important. Or, or, you know, Warren Buffett comes in. Come on over here. Sit in, my, sit in my place. But as we look around the room here, we go, hmm, I don't know. Not these people. <laughs> That's the challenge, right? That's the challenge for you and me is that I got to treat everyone more important than me. People who don't vote like me? What? Or look like me? Or have as much money as me? Or drive as nice a car as me? I got to treat those people better than me? Well, in this kingdom, and that's the challenge, I think that's the challenge. In this kingdom, we will serve each other. Our kingdom is being marked off by service. Not, not, we, don't, we don't have servants. We are the servant. Every single person in the kingdom serves. No matter what our rank is in the community, no matter what our position is in the community, we will serve. And that's why I love the church. Never so often. And I know some people's stories, and I know some stuff. And, I, and here's, what, here's what I love. When I see people who have great wealth, they don't flaunt it, they don't show it, but I know their stuff and I know. And they serve alongside down at the open door mission with people who have very little. 
and nobody's powering up on anybody, nobody's pushing anybody, nobody's saying, you know, that's not, that's, that's a little bit beneath me, why don't you go do that? Ever so often I get that in my head, why do I have to do this? After all, I'm the senior pastor, and I shouldn't have to take out the trash or clean a toilet. Where's my servants? Where are they? <laughs> Why do I have to do these things? And we do that at home, where we say, I'm the king of my castle. By the way, serving your wife, serving your husband is the highest thing you can do in your marriage. When both people are serving each other, it becomes a wonderful moment. But when somebody else says, you know what? I'm the king of the castle here, and I want you to do this stuff. Because after all, that's not what a king does. It gets kind of messy. Don't be selfish or try to impress. That's the kingdom of heaven. Being a king is about control and power. The kingdom of Jesus is... It's not about that at all. We're a lot like Simba. I said Mufasa the first hour and was corrected by a couple of kids. <laughs> that little lion cub, what was his theme song? I just can't wait to be king. That's us, king of the castle, boss, leader. But in our kingdom that we're a part of here is we're going to be the servant now how do we get into the kingdom mark chapter 10 verse 13 says one day some parents brought their children to jesus so he could touch them and bless them but the disciples scolded them they're bothering jesus when jesus saw what was happening he was angry check that out this is fascinating to me. this is fascinating we don't see jesus getting too angry too often right but he he does now why because they were keeping the little kids from getting close let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these. Here's the illustration of what our kingdom is going to be like. We're going to be like these little kids. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. See, in the first century, children's were, children were a nuisance. Still are, kind of anyway, but... Uh, but for them in the first century, children had no, they had no rank, no power, no, they, they could, right? They were, they were a bother. They are pushed aside, marginalized until they could produce in the home of some kind. They were property. But Jesus loved the little children. And I think they must have liked him as well. Kids teach us a whole lot about faith. That's one of the wonderful things about having little children in your home. Or having little children, grandkids around and, when, and you're seeing their faith and trust in people. We have a lot of people who are foster parents here at our church. And it's been a wonderful ministry in so many ways. And I've been on the front lines of seeing a lot of kids. And, and, uh, and it's been great. And these kids are taken out of a pretty toxic and, and there's a reason why they're getting taken out of the home. There's multiple reasons. So there's trauma that is happening. And so they're pulled out and they're placed into a foster care home. And I've watched over the course of several different parents how this, ha I mean, I don't even know how this happens. I, 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 don't, I don't know how they process, as a kid, as a three-year-old or an eight-year-old, process through this. Because I've been taken out of my home. There's a, there's, yes, there's lots of stuff going on, but now I'm in this home and, uh, and what has been wonderful for me to watch is the, the trust that these children eventually will place into these foster parents who they just have met. It is to me one of the most beautiful things of faith is that like we have been displaced as well and, and, and one of the most incredible things that we can do is simply have childlike faith in a God who's good and a God who we can trust. And that's what he's asking for us to do, is simply place our faith and trust in him, like a little child, who we would say doesn't even know any better. 
but finding over a course of time, this person, this adult can be trusted. And what those kids learn is they're valued and wanted. And what we learn as well in this kingdom, that we are valued and wanted, even though we have trauma in our lives, even though we are, are being displaced all the time. It is about a faith like a child. That's how we enter the kingdom. The kingdom is not uh, about building our own kingdom. It's really about building the kingdom. In Luke chapter 14, verse 50, he says, Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus explained, What a blessing it will be to attend the banquet in the kingdom of God. Now, I, I got a feeling that this guy thought through, What am I going to say to Jesus? Right? He rehearsed it. My guess, he had great enthusiasm. What a blessing it will be to be in the kingdom of God. Jesus is like, okay. Um... All right. Story time. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. All right. But they all began to make excuses. One said, I, I just bought a field and must inspect it. Hmm? Please excuse me. Okay. Another said, I've just bought a pair, uh, five pair of oxen. I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Okay. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Finally an honest person in the whole room, right? I mean, this is, I, well, I just got married. So, you know, <laughs> I'd like to, but I just got married. <laughs> That's my favorite one. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Why was he furious? Because there was excuses being made. You're invited to the party, to the kingdom. And you're, you're going, I, I got, what? I got to go inspect a field I just bought? Like you've never seen it, right? Like It's not like it was bought over the internet. Must have got a good smoking deal or something. I need to go look at it, see how it's doing. Okay. I bought some oxen. I want to go play with them. <laughs> excuse after excuse. Go invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. After the servant had done this, he was We got more room. We still have more room. His master says, well, then go out in the country lanes behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come in so that the house will be full. Jesus likes a full house. And so he had offered an invitation to people, and they said, you know, I'm too busy, I'm too important, I'm too whatever, and um, thank you for the invitation, but I'm not, I'm going to pass on the party of the century, right? This is going to be great. Lots of great wine, or good food, good music. Who wouldn't want to come to this? But over and over again, people were making excuses. You don't want to come. Then go, let's go invite anybody, right? Let's invite, we've got plenty of food. We've got plenty of wine. We've got plenty of music. Invite the poor. This is for everyone. Everybody gets in. The marginalized, the people who don't typically get to come to a party, gets to come to this party. And even so, even if after they got those people, like, we still got more room. Go find anybody and urge them to come in. You guys, that is our job. The servant was the one who invited the people to come out. Go to the, he tells the servant, go get them. Okay. And you and, and me, that is our job in the kingdom, is to go and invite pe other people to come into the kingdom. It's that simple. I met a person today at the first service, and her friend was, I say friend, they just met. They were at a storage unit, and they were both at the storage unit, and they got talking in she invited her to church and she came today that's it just urge them to come in hey you want to come with me You're like okay and what we're finding is that yes there's lots of excuses right now for not coming to church we have all used them um, covid it's too whatever it's too and we begin to use a lot of excuses 
and we begin to pull away from the kingdom. Christmas is all about the fact that Jesus wanted to get close to us. He came from heaven to earth, right? He wanted to get close to us. And he wanted to show us what God is like. And I don't know, over the past year and a half or two, wherever, if you felt closer to God more than ever or farther away from God. It, it may be both. There might be times where, you know, you, you stop praying, you stop thinking about it, you didn't go to church, you, you tried the online thing, and, and it was tolerable, but it was fine. And for you, it didn't work very well. I don't know how many people I've talked to that say, I love the online thing, it's been great, it's super helpful. And maybe there's been some trauma in your life where you've experienced death or you've experienced, there, there's so much, so much struggle right now. People have lost loved ones, lost their jobs, lost their careers. Now, more, I, I've gotten more calls and emails from people who are saying, I'm quitting my job, I'm quitting my job. I don't want to do the mask thing. I don't want to do the poke thing. I don't want to do that. I'm quitting. And other people have said, I'm quitting my job because it's too stressful. I just can't. It's not good for my marriage. So there's been a lot of loss. And during that time, oftentimes in our time of loss, we pulled away from God. Now for some of you, you're clicking on real well. I've talked with a lot of people lately who've just like, we are doing great. I got baptized. I, I, I'm now in a rooted group. I love coming to church. So there's lots of things that might be causing you to pull away or get close to God. I want you to know that God has done everything he can to get close to you. He'll forgive your sin, which is like you push it, you like, uh-uh. Or, you know, he, 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 he's, he's going to take care of all of that stuff so that you can get close to him. And I think now, right now, at Christmas, when we're thinking about the fact that Jesus came to earth, now's the time to draw close to him. We're going to have time of communion. And uh, if you grabbed one of these as you came in, maybe if you're watching at home, it's a good time just to uh, like, hey, let's do this. I'd kind of like to do it a little bit different today. And, and um, maybe we can just do this all at once. You pop the little top off there, grab the bread and the juice. It's it's hard to think about Christmas without Easter. In fact, you can't. If there was no Easter, there's no Christmas. And so this is Easter. The body of Christ and the blood of Christ are symbolically shown to us and realized today in these two elements. It is God's, one again, attempt to get close to us, to draw near. The king became the servant who became the sacrifice. There's not another king like that. So I'll pray, and then maybe we could do this together, coordinate a little bit, is that we'll, we'll eat the bread and the drink the juice together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this moment in time where we do maybe feel a little bit closer to you than we have in a long time. For some, it's the first time we've been back to church in over a year. For some, it's been 10 years. <sighs> Maybe we were just mad at you. Maybe we were mad at ourselves. But for whatever reason today, we felt the tug to come a little closer. We're surprised that you... still love us. And so right now, we push the pause button for a, a moment. Like those little children, we kind of want to crawl up in your lap. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let's eat this together.
in the road and come see the scars of love upon his hands the king is in the road and we'll watch the darkness flee at his command and who is this king who is this king oh his name is jesus his name is jesus light of the world there's freedom in his name and awesome in power
so glad you're able to join us. We'll see you back next week.